Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tamar Hoffnung, and I am the Israel Institute Fellow at the YNS Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. And I am happy to welcome you to this event hosted by the YNS um, Nazarian Center for Israel Studies, um, titled Narratives of Trauma and Recovery, The Healing Power of Stories in Literature and Life. And I'm delighted to introduce you our special guest for today, um, who is Ayelet Gundar Goshen, who is an author and a clinical psychologist renowned for her captivating storytelling and her unique talent of instilling emotional depth, as showcased in her four novels, One Night Markowitz, Waking Lions, The Liar, and her latest work, for which she will talk about today in more detail, The Wolf Hunt. Ayelet's adept storytelling has won her prestigious awards, including the Sapir Prize for Literature of Israel. Her literary works have transcended borders, being translated into over 14 um, languages and earning recognition from European and American literary circles. Beyond her literary achievements, Ayelet is really a multifaceted individual contributing insightful commentaries on a diverse range of topics to leading platforms such as BBC's The Cultural Frontier, Financial Times, Time Magazine, The Telegraph, and The Atlantic. She also lectured at UC Berkeley, Columbia University, here at UCLA, um, and Carleton College, among other institutions. Notably, Ayelet's impacts extend beyond the realm of literature. As a practicing clinical psychologist, she seamlessly interwines her passion for storytelling with her dedication to treating patients. In the wake of the tragic terrorist attack on October 7th, the psychiatric hospital where Ayelet serves declared a state of emergency. Since then, Ayelet has immersed herself in aiding the victims, leveraging the power of narrative as a therapeutic tool in overcoming trauma. With her diverse array of talents and unwavering commitment to both literature and mental health, Ayelet continues to inspire and uplift audiences worldwide, demonstrating the profound impact of storytelling on healing and resilience. In her talk today, she will discuss her new book, The Wolf Hunt, and the impact of trauma in her literary work. She will also share with, her, with us her experience working with terror victim in Israel after October 7th, focusing on the impact of mass trauma on the, and the possibility of healing. So please uh, join me in welcoming Ayelet. I will start by a, a, a bit of apologizing. This is um, this reading was supposed to be in October, and I canceled it because of what happened. And I just arrived in the state three days ago, and I still feel that it's a bit strange for me to talk right now about about everything. When I talk about literature, I feel that it's how can you talk about literature with what's going on right now in Israel? So it doesn't feel right. And when I don't talk at all about literature and I only talk about trauma on October 7th, it also feels wrong because it feels as if the entire identity, the entire personality is wiped out by the trauma and the only thing that is left is talking about trauma all the time. Um, so I feel like I'm still struggling to find this balance between talking about what's going on right now and about the trauma, but also reminding myself, I think, that, that literature still exists, that, that we, we were here before October 7th and that we want to have something after October 7th. Um, so things are a bit raw right now, that's what I'm saying, and, and that's why I'm a bit apologizing in advance. And I will say something specifically about the wolf hunt because I think the moment I realized that I'm not just treating people suffering from trauma, but that I might be a bit traumatized myself, was the moment I realized that I can't read my own novel uh, for quite a long time after the terror attack because it was just too much for me so that something that was written as fiction suddenly became uh, too real and too close uh, even even for the person who wrote it and um, so i think i will start by telling a bit about how the wolf hunt uh, started 
what the story is about and why I think for me it was a bit traumatic after October 7th, but also what it taught me afterwards uh, about dealing with trauma. So the Wolf Hunt actually started, it, it's a novel that has a birth date. I can show you in the calendar the, the exact birth date. It's the only novel that I can tell you the date when it was born. And it's because it's a very meaningful day in, uh, in Israeli calendar. It's uh, September 1st, Rishon September, which is the day, uh, the first day of the school year in Israel. And I was taking my daughter, she was four years old back then, to her first day at preschool in Tel Aviv. And we were entering the preschool hand in hand. And she was walking like this and I was a bit shaky. And then when we, we entered the preschool, I realized that I'm looking at all the other kids with those suspicious looks. I mean, I was scanning the faces of all the little girls, thinking which one of you sweet little girls here is going to be that nasty girl that's going to say something bad to my daughter the moment I leave the room, the moment I leave her alone in this jungle, disguised as a, as a bright, colorful class. And I was looking at the face of, of really toddlers and with such paranoid gaze, I mean, really trying to identify which one of the girls here or which one of the boys here might do something or say something, a nasty comment or laugh at her hair or about how she's dressed. And I was trying to identify the, the potential threat to my baby before I leave her alone in, in this class. And as I left, the preschool that day uh, I don't know how is it here but in Tel Aviv we leave them for in the first day just for a few hours and then you come back to pick them so when I left I realized that I wasn't the only one uh, being a bit paranoid and suddenly I realized that all the other moms and dads are actually looking at the other kids with the exact same looks so that each one of the mothers was trying to identify where is, the, where is that nasty girl? Where is the, the class bully? Each one of the dads was giving those suspicious looks at, as well. And I thought, as I came out, I thought it's so interesting how all of us share the same fear. We all share the fear that one of the other kids might harm our, our child. And I thought, wait a minute, how, how come none of us stops to ask this question? What if it's my child? who's in fact the bully? What if it's my little girl, the innocent cub I was talking about, who's in fact gonna say something nasty to another girl the moment I leave the room in order to feel superior and to build her self-esteem or... And this was a very disturbing question that I had at that moment. And as I walked back home, I, I asked myself, how much do I know the answer? I mean, how certain I am as a mother that I know what's going on right now, that I know that I can say no, but my daughter will never do such a thing. And I also ask myself, how much do I really want to know the answer? Um, how much do I, do I really want to look into this question seriously? And as I came back home and, and I met my partner and I told him about this, this thought that I had and I asked him a question and I said, say you had a choice. In real life, we don't get this choice, but say you had this choice. Our daughter, our little girl at the preschool right now, being bullied by another girl, but she knows that she's pure from within and she knows that she's not doing any harm to anyone else, but she's being bullied right now as we speak. Or you could choose her to be the bully so that we know that right now she's safe. Her self-esteem is, is very much balanced. She feels very confident, but she's stepping on another girl's self esteem, as we speak right now, what, what would you rather have? I asked my partner, I'm asking you right now. And what was interesting for me was I thought about it as a question. He didn't find it to be a, a legitimate question. He looked at me and was very shocked by the question. And he said, favorite. As I'm in Imat, which is English for what kind of mother are you? What kind of mother even asks this question? 
And I didn't understand. I said, but I think it's it's an interesting question. I think it's it's a good question. We have to kill those two hours before we can save her from the preschool. So let's talk about something. <laughs> and he said, I'm not even answering this question. This is such, he said in Hebrew, that <laughs> which is the, the English would be, I think this is such a woke question to even ask. And, and then he said, and I thought it was a very typical Israeli macho response. I don't know what would be the response of, of an American man, but he said, of course I prefer my child to be the bully rather than to, to have her being the victim. This is not even a question. Of course I prefer to raise a bully than to raise a victim because a bully, you can educate. You can help her grow out of that. You can, you can take it out of her. But if she's a victim, then she will bear those scars for life. If in her first day at kindergarten, she's a bully, she might remember that, she might not remember that. But if she will be bullied in her first day in kindergarten, she will remember that. Just as most people remember how they were offended far more clear than the moments when they offended others. And I listened to this and I was very um, upset by it. And as he kept calling me Smolanit and, and saying um, that I'm uh, too much of a liberal or a lefty. And I said, well, you know what? I, I think this is not just you talking. I think this is the family heritage, your family heritage talking. I think this is the third generation of Holocaust survivors syndrome talking from your mouth right now. Because in my partner's family, the ethos was we shall never be victims again. And this was a moment when a, a, a discussion um, between two parents, two individuals, all of a sudden became from a very private, intimate discussion to a political Israel discussion when he said, you're such a small and it's such a woke. It was contemporary Israeli politics. And when I pulled out the, the psychologist card and related to his mother and, and his family heritage, it became not just a, a political Israel discussion, it became a discussion about Jewish identity and about the burden. And we just talked right now before the, the event about this question of we both have young children. When do you tell your kids? Um, I have a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old and a two-year-old. And I was wondering with my nine-year-old when she was born and she was this sweet baby. And I thought, I don't know nothing about her right now because she was just born, but I know that one day she will like find out that being a woman, that because she was born a girl, it's totally different than being born a boy. I don't want to tell it to her, but there will be a moment when she realizes that when she walks in the street, it's not going to be the same for her as for the baby boy that I will have a few years later. And I also thought, what will be the moment she realizes what it means to be a woman? And what will be a moment when she realizes what it means to be Jewish? In which age will I tell her the, the history? Because we don't let her watch violent TV. We don't let her watch, she's nine years old, no Batman, no Spider-Man, because it's too violent. When is the right age to talk about the Holocaust? Which is not a film, it's not a story. You can't protect yourself by saying, okay, this is not real. And right now with, with the two years old baby, we're, we're saying how the entire family is jealous of him because he's the only one that doesn't know what's going on right now. And he's the only one walking very happy even after October 7th. And this was the moment in our, this discussion that we had that I thought, what I thought was this, debate between two parents about how to raise a child is not just the individual level of what does it mean to be a parent? Do I want to raise a child that feels good about himself? Or do I want to raise a child who is a good person? What happens when it contradicts, which is the individual level. But I also felt the political level of current Israeli discussion of do you want to be the aggressor? Um, or would you risk being a victim? And the, the bigger Jewish identity 
about what does it mean to be Jewish? What moral responsibility do we carry with us? What kind of lesson uh, do we want to take from our history? The universal lesson of you shall never be a bystander or the particular lesson of you shall never let anyone do something like this to you or your family ever again. And back then was a theoretical discussion. So I walked back to the preschool to pick up my daughter and on the way to pick her up, I thought, okay, this is going to be the next novel. Because if we could talk about it for two hours, then I'm, I'm curious enough about it to want to go into this journey. And then I took this very personal experience that I had as a mother leaving my child at the preschool and I constructed it differently in the novel so that in the novel, it's an Israeli family relocating to America and to the Silicon Valley. The father is working in tech and the mother is quite happy to get out of Israel. She is tired of um, Israeli politics. She's tired of Netanyahu. She's tired of walking into a room and searching for the exit sign so that in case of emergency, she'll know where to go, which is something my mom taught me when I grew up at the time of the terror attack in the 90s. Uh, I can tell you every place in Tel Aviv, what's the fastest way to get out in case of a terror attack? And the protagonist of the novel doesn't want her children to scan for the emergency exit where, wherever they enter a room. And she chooses to raise her child in America. And she thinks of her Israel identity and also I think of her Jewish identity as a burden, as this very heavy coat that she wants to take off, like when you reach a, a warm room, like the warm California sun, and you can take off this heavy coat. She wants to take off this coat of her Jewish and Israeli identity and just be the citizen of the world. She wants to, to emerge into the American dream, which I think it's interesting because for so many years, the ultimate dream for Jews was to get to the promised land and to pray with your, to get to the, to the East. And nowadays in Israel, we see so many Israelis that their ultimate Israeli dream is to live the American dream, is to go back to the West. And I think for my grandparent who fought to, to found this country, this is a very shocking experience to, to see what's going on. So the protagonist is this woman that wants to get out of Israel to protect her children, her child, her one child, Adam. And then there's a terror attack at the local synagogue, which is based on, on a real event that happened here. And she starts to fear that she might have taken her child out of Israel to protect him from the Israeli madness, only to expose him to a different kind of madness, to the American madness. And she sends him to study Krav Maga, self-defense, in order to never be a victim. And then she starts to fear that he might have took those feelings of this need for revenge, which you can see right now in, in the Israeli society, and his own feeling of being humiliated and being bullied, and that he might have been involved in a hate crime against another child from his class, um, a black Muslim kind, uh, who is dead, and some people say that her child might have killed him, and she doesn't know. She doesn't know if it's anti-Semitism, if it's a blood label. She doesn't know if she might be wrong. And it might be that her own child is that wolf, the wolf that she was afraid of is lurking out there, just like I was afraid that the wolf is somewhere in the kindergarten and not willing to, to risk and look at my own daughter and ask if she could possibly be a wolf. And as I wrote it, I thought of my job as a mother, but I also thought about Israel and how we always see ourselves, I think, in the Israeli psyche as the ultimate victim. And could it be that we're missing something about our own aggressiveness? And this is all before October 7. And then October 7th came and I was unable to, to read this novel, to open this novel, to read from this novel. And uh, what a reader wrote to me and reminded me of a, of a sentence there, which even back then when I wrote it, I felt uncomfortable with. 
And my mother was very upset about it because she said, I know it's fiction, but I, I just hate this sentence. And there's a moment where the, where the protagonist who left Israel, she says that she actually loved Israel very much. She loved Israel the way a woman that was beaten by her husband loved her husband, but knows that she has to, to get away with it from him to protect herself and to protect the kids. And when this reader wrote to me after October 7, and she said, what, what do you think about the sentence right now? I think this was the moment when I felt that I can't, not only that I can't write a single word, but I, I also don't want to read a single word right now. And I think for me, this was the moment of realizing what happens when something that you thought was fiction comes sneaking behind you and, and jumps on you. And this comes to this idea of stories that haunt us versus stories that heal us. Because I'm shifting now to, to my work as a therapist. Since October 7th, um, we've been doing a lot. I think most of our work is um, interventions with either uh, survivors of the massacre. Right after the massacre, they were evacuated to Elat, and the mental health hospital had delegations um, like with shifts working in Elat with the people that escaped. And with survivors of the Nova massacre, the, the nature party, and with many people who are not directly affected, but are uh, refugees right now, um, because they, they were had to be evacuated either from the south or from the north. And one of the things I saw was how much the way you construct a story can help determine whether the person that we meet will suffer from PTSD, from post-traumatic stress disorder or not. So that it's not that therapy can heal something. You cannot heal through therapy. You cannot take away pain through therapy. I wish we could, but you can't. But what we do see is that if you're able to take the, the facts, the raw reality and construct it into a story, a story that has a beginning and has an ending so that you know how a fairy tale starts with once upon a time and ends when we say the end like when in films when you have like written very big the end right and i never realized and until the last few months how much our mind works in the same way so that in order to be able to process a traumatic event we have to be able to write those two words the end, and, and I will give an example that people that just came out from, from the massacre, you see flashbacks, you see intrusive memories, you see people who are being with you right now, but for a moment they forget that they're with you. They feel like they're right now being under attack as if it's happened. There's the barrier between the past and the present collapses so that you're in a way doomed to, to relive the past as if it is the present. And one of the things that we found to be very helpful is shifting from present tense to past tense. So that when a person is saying, I'm running, we say, you ran. When a person is saying, they're shooting, I'm saying, they shot. And that when a person says, I, can, I, I have to, to stop in the middle, and you also want to stop because it's a terrible story, but, but we're saying, Let's try to get to the end. Let's try to get to the end of that day, to the moment when you felt safe again. What was that moment? We're trying to reach the end so that we can differentiate between what was and what is right now. And once again, this, is, this can't take away the pain or the loss, not at all. But this can help the person to rebuild this barrier between the past and the present, because as long as the past is not the past, then you can't start healing, right? And it's, you, you can't even stop bleeding when you can't make this differentiation. And so that's one example. I will give another example of the way I, th I, I saw that how the story is constructed affects the way people recover, if you can use the word recover. And it comes to this question of who is telling the story? 
many people tell the story of October 7 with a lot of guilt and shame and feeling of helplessness. So people can say, um, I just lied pretending to be dead and I didn't do anything for hours. I didn't do anything. I didn't run. I didn't call for help. Um, I just pretending to be dead so that no one will shoot me. And you can, you can, when I said, I think you could smell the guilt in, in what I said right now. And, and you can see how this guilt can be like a, like a poison arrow, you know, because if you feel like I did something, I was so helpless, I was completely impotent. Um, I think there's also a bit of self accusation, right? As if it was supposed to be this Bruce Willis or Rambo and just go and do what the entire IDF didn't do. I was supposed to go and do it. This one person was supposed to go and stand there and, and stop it all. And then what we would do as therapists is that we will listen to the story, but we will try to tell it differently. So we will say that it takes a whole lot of strength to be able to pretend to be dead and not to move for hours when there are terrorists in the, tech, in the house. And a whole lot of self-control and that you need to have everything within you to be able to pretend dead for so many hours when this is going on. And this is, it's a small shift, but this is exactly the difference between having this poisoned error of feeling guilty and self-accusation that can go on to be infectious or between accepting what happened and accepting your own bravery, even if it's a passive bravery. Also, I'll give another example of, of the way we construct stories and the difference between stories that hunt us and stories that heal us. It also has a lot to do with guilt. This feeling of so many people in the Israeli society right now that we don't deserve to enjoy life. We don't deserve to be, to go to a restaurant right now or to go dancing, of course not. Um, I will give an, an example of, of a patient who gave her agreement, so I, I'm sharing this in details. I had a patient after October 7th that um, was evacuated from the south, and she didn't leave the house for more than a month when I met her. She just, she never went outside. She was afraid that the terror attack would happen again. She would sit next to the window and look outside to watch if, if somebody is coming. And it's interesting because people wanted to help. So people brought groceries, people brought food, people brought everything to her. And that's a mistake we make when we want to help someone and we treat him like a baby. And so we feel, so we feel very powerful and very potent. We feel like the grown-ups, but they feel like a baby. And, and one of the things that you do when you try to help someone immediately after a terror attack, after every traumatic attack, is, is not to say, I'll bring you a glass of water, is to say, you want to go together and get a glass of water. And sometimes you would even say, I'm a bit thirsty. There's a chance that you could bring me a glass of water to activate the person rather than to, to jump to the role of the superhero and unintentionally leave the person in this identity of, as, a, as a victim. And, and with her, people brought things and she became more and more isolated. And then I asked her, about who she was before. Because as I told you, I think that one of the things was, was terror or was pain is that it looks like this ocean on all sides of pain. You don't see the land, you don't see any possible ground to stand on. All you see is your pain. And sometimes you need someone to remind you that that a solid ground does exist, even if you don't see it right now, that if you'll just keep your head above the water long enough, then we can get there. And one of the ways doing that is to remember that there used to be a solid ground, that we had other parts in us rather than this title of the terror victim. So I asked her, what did she used to do before? And she said she really liked taking walks and listening to Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, do you want to do it now? Is there any chance that, that you can do it today? And she looked at me and she was so upset with me suggesting this. 
because she was saying something like, we have, back then was over 200 people kept hostage in Gaza right now. And you're telling me to take a walk in the park and listen to Taylor Swift? What kind of therapist are you? What kind of human being are you? And for me, this was a very clear moment of realizing how dangerous guilt can be. Because guilt can be a very powerful fuel for change. That's the creative guilt, right? That the guilt that pushes us to create something different. You say, I feel terrible about this, so I will act differently from now on. That's creative guilt, that, that's guilt as a fuel. But guilt can just as well be sedative guilt, okay? Guilt that sedates us, guilt that makes us sit in our home, not go outside, feel guilty, in a way, lock ourselves in this imaginary cell, like a, a mental dungeon, so that for this woman, because there are hostages in Gaza right now and they're kept locked, she has to remain locked. And even though she comes to therapy because she wants to feel better and she understands that she, she has to, to get better for her kids, for her own sake, there is part of in, inside of her that doesn't want to get better. There is part inside of her that thinks that feeling happy again is betraying the memories of those who were lost. And then I feel that our job as therapists is to, to help this woman construct a new narrative, which puts the emphasis about the fact that the people who lost their life didn't want her to stay locked up in an apartment forever. This is what Hamas wanted for her. But this is not what the victims wanted for her. And with many survivors of the, the party, of the Nova party, you hear that a lot, because wh why did I remain alive when others didn't? How can I go back dancing or go back being happy when my friends are still hostage at Gaza right now? And what we're saying is, well, would your friend in Gaza right now want you to, to lock yourself up for forever or would they want you to go out and live for their sake and live in their memory and tell be able to tell their story and it's something very interesting that we see in tel aviv right now at first no one came out the restaurants were open after a few weeks but no one went sitting in a restaurant just felt morally wrong and I think right now people are starting, you, I, you don't see people dancing on the tables in Tel Aviv like you, you saw before, but people are coming out again. And, and I think it's a good thing because I think this is part of reclaiming our identity. This is part of saying we, we will not be like only the, the victims or only the survivors. We insist on, on having a normal life, even though nothing is normal right now nothing is normal um, so i think these are two examples of the way things that i used to think about like storytelling or perspectives suddenly started to echo in my work as a therapist and my last example before we open it up for for discussion and questions is is not from therapy it's, it's actually from something i experienced as a mother which is how we talk with the kids and how we, we try to explain to the kids. And also what I feel is how I try to teach my kids not to hate all Palestinians. Because I think when something like October 7th happens, then not just for kids, but also for grown-ups, the easier thing to do is to divide the world for a very clear the dichotomy of, of good guys and bad guys, the forces of good and the forces of evil. And the idea of trying to insist with the kids on the very clear separation between Hamas and between Palestinians, between supporters of Hamas and between Palestinian civilians, between um, supporters of Hamas and between Arab Israelis. And it was very interesting for me because I thought about there's this writing exercise that I give students sometimes. Um, and I gave it the title, Know Thy Enemy. And usually, Know Thy Enemy is considered a tactical warning, right? You're supposed to know thy enemy and able to, to defeat him. 
But I thought about know the enemy as this writing exercise when you have to take someone you really, really hate and write two pages from this person's perspective. And the, the exercise was that to get a good grade in it, the student had to write it in a way that I would feel empathy or I would root or that I would feel like I can truly understand this hated person through the text. And so I gave it to students and then I started giving it to patients about real life events. And they hated this exercise because when you hate someone, you don't want to write two pages of the world from their perspective. You just want to hate them properly without nobody bothering you in the middle. <laughs> and whenever I do it with my daughter, she always says, I, I don't want to think about it from her perspective. I came back from school, I hate this girl and I want you to hate her just as much as I do, maybe a bit more. And then maybe I will be able, after you give me the solidarity, after you validate my feeling, maybe I will be able to reconsider. But first I need validation. And when I look at it with my daughter, and I'm thinking about what's going on right now in the Israeli society, and how people in Israel are obsessed about the way we are covered in Europe or the way the war is covered in the US. And at first, I didn't get it. I thought we have so much bigger problems right now than how we're covered by the Belgium newspaper. Why did they, why did they even write about it? I, I didn't get it. And only after this discussion I had with my daughter, I thought, okay, people are seeking the, the validation. They're seeking the, the acknowledgement the way, you know, when a baby falls down, the, the first thing he does, at least my baby, no, I think all babies, the first thing he does when he falls down is he doesn't look at the wound. He looks at me like this. He's searching for me because the wound in itself, that's one thing. But the question is, how is the world going to react to my pain? Is my face going to, to echo his pain and then he can be a bit relaxed? Am I going to say, ah, it's nothing? And then he has to shout louder to prove that it's not nothing. He's in pain. I think about this beautiful painting of Bruegel, and it's called The Landscape with the Falling of Icarus. I think that's how it's called in English. Icarus in Hebrew. It's a painting, and you see the, the landscape, you see the farmers, and they're working in the field. And then you see Icarus falling from the sky, and nobody lifts his head to look at him while he's falling. And this is such a powerful painting and, and such a tragic painting. And the tragedy isn't just the falling of Icarus, which is what we, people usually paint. It's the fact that Bruegel chose to paint not just the falling, but the fact that nobody stops to, to look at what happened, to be willing to be a witness to somebody else's pain. And I feel this is something that I'm trying to do in therapy. And this is something very meaningful that many Israelis did get from, from the Jewish community outside of Israel. The idea of solidarity, the idea of people who truly dare to look and want to witness the pain. And I think for many people, this, this meant so much in, in the last few months. And I think it's gonna mean a lot also in the weeks to come. Uh, I will stop here for, for our discussion and for your questions. So in recent, recently, I was so engaged in academic reading and writing that I didn't have enough time to read fine literature. And uh, coming to this event, finally, I had the opportunity um, to go force myself to, to read. And, and, and your novel really reminded me how much I love um, literature and how enjoyable um, it is. I think I still think about the characters, about Lach and Adam and Michael and, um, and how they're feeling right now. And I think reading um, The Wolf Hand actually after October 7th um, makes it feel very contemporary in a way, um, especially when it touches upon the issue of anti-Semitism um, that we have, uh, that, that I think that for Israelis um, immigrating here to the United States, um, this has become quite of a shock. Um, when I was reading it, I was thinking, 
um, that in a way for, for, for many that really decide to, to migrate um, in order to kind of escape the violence um, of the region, it, it in a way kind of felt like the Oedipus curse um, that you're kind of hoping to have to, to bring a life where your kids do not have to be part of the conflict and suddenly um, you're awakened to this issue of anti-Semitism, which is an Israeli um, you you don't really experience and you don't quite understand. Um, and I think that that was uh, very interesting to read um, in the Wolf And I was wondering if you can elaborate more on like how you came about to really discuss that and think about those hate crimes um, much before this was, or at least this felt here as such a pronounced phenomenon as we have felt it here since October 7th. Growing up in Israel, I didn't think about anti-Semitism until I came out of Israel. Because I think when you're inside the country, you're never called the Jew, because you're the majority. And the first time I experienced anti-Semitism, I was in, uh, in Germany, and I saw swastika. And at first, it had no effect on me, because Teenagers in Israel do draw swastika. This is what you do when you're a teenager and you want to rebel against your teacher. So you draw this little swastika on the table, and then you do it like this, and you show it to your friend. And this is this is part of being 17, uh, I think, for, for many kids. So I saw swastikas sometimes um, at school's toilets, and but it was always, okay, I said it. And I remember walking in, and I remember walking and seeing one in Germany, and for the first moment I was just walking, and then I stopped and I said, "Ah, oh, wow, that's not the one I know. That that's something completely different. The one who drew that that one is not a, a Jewish uh, adolescent. It's somebody who actually meant it." And this was my my first time experiencing something like this. And for me, it comes back to this question. I ask myself right now as a mother, when do I want my children to, to learn about that? And what's going to happen to, to their faith, to their trust in, because they're so young, so I think they still have this uh, naive trust in, in mankind. They don't know. And what, when the moment that you tell your, your child that he was born to this club of, of people that were, you know, massacre throughout the, the generation. I, I don't know what's the right age to, to, to do this conversation. And I feel that that has been a really ongoing conversation. Um, even for me with my, with my husband, um, we had this conversation about whether or not we'll go back to Israel. And he said, and he said well, would you like your kids to, to join the army? Um, and I think horrified by anti-Semitism, I was like, but you know what, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know if I want my kids to know what anti-Semitism is. Um, and, and I think that that's a thought that never occurred to me until, um, until recently. Um, I was also very moved by your, your discussion of guilt. And I think that one of the interesting um, things that you mentioned, I, I noticed there's really two things. One issue is really the idea of volition or control or having control. Um, and, and that might also tap into that helplessness and, and that kind of memory of the Holocaust of having no, no control and no volition. Um, and I think that in your, in your Atlantic piece, you, you make a very interesting argument about guilt, um, which revolves around the real notion um, that there is something in, in our understanding or in, in our social in our social ethics or or I guess Weber will call it the Protestant ethic that we that we in a way are kind of responsible for our fates and if something bad happens to us then that's somehow related to um, to how to what we to what we've done or we somehow deserve that type of guilt um, and. I, I wanted if you could elaborate more if you, uh, about these experiences that you kind of had with patients about having that sense of, of guilt. And I will. I, I think we can differentiate between different kinds of of guilt. 
because you can say that guilt is a way of, of feeling in control because if there's something I feel guilty about, there is this hidden assumption that I could do something uh, to make it different. We don't feel guilty about in our everyday life about things that we have no control over. So if I will say I feel so guilty about Kanye West and Kim Kardashian getting divorced, then you would say, did you have anything to do with this matter? I mean, I mean, this, right? It sounds, if you're not tied to this relationship, then you shouldn't feel guilty about this, this divorce. So you can say that when people feel guilty about something, the benefit of it is that we maintain this hidden assumption that if only I had acted differently, things could be different. Well, the scariest notion, and that's far more scary than feeling guilty, is to acknowledge the fact that I had no control, that whatever I, I would have done couldn't change anything. And people would rather feel guilty because this maintained the, the hidden sense of control rather than feel completely impotent and, and with no sense of control. And so, so I think this is one aspect of, the, of guilt. I think the second is that it's very difficult to try and, and release people from the burden of this poisonous guilt when society, when we're brought up in a culture that um, cherishes guilt, um, from the primal sin to the, the Protestant idea of, of if you work hard, you succeed, which says that if, well, if you didn't succeed, it means that you didn't work hard enough. And if we say that good things happen to people who do good, then bad things probably happen to people who didn't do good. And that if something bad happened to you, just as you see with victims of um, uh, sexual abuse, when they said, so maybe it was something I, I wore, um, like may, maybe I shouldn't have gone out at dark. The idea of, I, I probably did something, because all the fairy tales tell us that if something happen, bad happens to Little Red Riding Hood, it's because she talked to the wolf or because she was dressed in red, and not because there are wolves out there and they will do it. And I think, in a way, that just like victims of sexual abuse, people who suffered a terror attack were also objectified. They were objectified not for sexual uh, desire, they were objectified for the lust of killing. And once again, it's deciding that you don't want to, to think of yourself as an object. It's saying that you have agency. But then when you're saying you had agency, you're coming back to this question of, if I had agency, could ha I do things differently? And I think if you use guilt as a motivator, then it can be a very um, ecological fuel, like not polluting. But if you use it the, the wrong way, and you know, when, when you think about pop culture, then half of pop culture is, is based on the survivor syndrome. Harry Potter, Batman, think about all the orphans that have to prove that their, their lives are worthy, that the fact that they were spared uh, meant something that they are now going to fight the evil to, to show that, that it's, it's okay that they survive while their parents didn't. There's a reason why it appears in pop culture. It's the, the, the DNA of the human soul, and the best way to see it is caps lock written in, in comics books. Um, and I think if people construct this narrative, it might lead to what we call a post-traumatic growth. But if you construct a narrative of, of this poisonous guilt, then this can be very dangerous. This can haunt people for, for years. This can go across generations. And when we think about, about guilt, I think that one of the issues is that we kind of live in a <coughs> in the risk society, right? Part of the idea of why we circumscribe or we denote actions um, that we can minimize our risk is part of what we kind of, especially I think when it comes to sexual violence, um, is the idea that we we try to minimize risk, so we try to suggest different things that people will do, and that often brings the risk on the person who had the risky behavior. But then I think in a way, in, 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 in this 
this aftermath of October 7th that, that I think is part of a different vulnerability that has been kind of exposed in that the expectation of the state to protect its citizens or the contract between the state and the citizens has been kind of completely um, shattered. Um, do you see it differently? Because uh, I was just, yeah, I was thinking about the analogy with the sexual violence and how society treats them and then this particular situation um, feels in a way kind of that it will impact people differently. And I think the sense of betrayal was, was enormous. Um, it still is enormous. Uh, specifically the Yom Shabbat on, on Saturday, Saturday of October 7th, the, the idea of getting text messages from friends saying, where's the police work? Yeah, I mean, people in the South texting friends <laughs> in the center and, and asking ourselves, are, are we supposed to go there? Where's the army? This sense of, of betrayal was and still is terrible. I think part of the thing is, you know, there's a Jean Paul Sartre was hell is other people, and that when we came to to Eilat to meet the people that were just evacuated, then really the feeling was that that all hell broke loose, and that the fear of everyone and you suspect everyone. And I remember we were in the mall, the shopping mall in Eilat, and there was a balloon in McDonald's that uh, you say pop. That's the pot. And the reaction of people in the shopping mall. One woman fainted. People started running. People were pushing. People were screaming. It was really the... It, it, if, if people had guns in this situation, and Ben wants everyone to have a gun, right? It could be a very dangerous moment. Because when everything is so traumatic, then a pop of a balloon can, can trigger these behaviors. But at the same time, what was very present in Eilat wasn't just the tell is other people, but also that other people can be the healing power. Because when people came to Eilat from the Kibbutzim and they came with nothing, they ran with nothing, by the time they got there, there were people coming with supplies, there were people coming with clothes, there were people coming with toys, there were like the, the entire civil society I mean, the government failed, but the civil society proved its worth. And I think this had a, a healing effect for many people, to feel betrayed by the government, but not to feel betrayed at all by, by your fellow men, was something very, very crucial for so many people. And I have a friend who is part of the Brothers in Arms. It's a movement that is very big in the demonstrations against the legal coup. And one of the things that Brothers in Arms did right in October 7th, October 8th, was to take people away from the road, the Tivot, of Fakim, from the, the, the south to the hotels, just to drive people, just to, to drive people with their stuff. And one of my friends volunteered to do that, and he said, I was sitting in the car, and it's a long drive to Elat, right? It's a five hours, four hours drive. So I'm taking my car, and I'm driving this person, who by July we almost killed each other because he supports Bibi, and I'm a, a lefty Tel Avivian. And I'm driving him in my car, which is full of stuff that he took to, and he's telling me, how come you came to drive us and the government they didn't bring buses, where, where is everyone? And then this man said, the sentence about that right now, it does feel like everyone is brother and sister. It just feels like the parents are completely dysfunctioning, but you have a lot of brothers and sisters. And did you feel that that created a real dissonance when you were treating patients, their betrayal, and then having people who they thought initially were their, their well, not enemy, but that that were not in their side, or maybe even enemy, um, kind of being the ones that were there for them? I think it was very meaningful for for a lot of people. I heard uh, Nehav Watt, she's a psychoanalyst, and she described how she came to uh, Yanomech, to the Dead Sea, to work with survivors, and how 
there was a woman who said, an elderly woman who survived the massacre of the kibbutz, and she said that in such a world, she, she doesn't want to exist in a world where such people exist. She doesn't want to exist. And then Meirav told her, well, look around you right now. And they were doing therapy session in the dining hall because we didn't have room, so we did therapy at the pool in the dining hall. <coughs> so and she said, look at this dining hall. And in this kind of world, would you like to exist? And she looked, and it was full of people that came bringing supplies and, and toys for the kids and everything. And she said, yes, because these are our angels. And I think in times like this, you see this shift between you know, looking and saying there is so much evil in people, how can we go on? But then again, you can also see the biggest moments of grace coming out of people. I mean, I live in such a... Um, like in a very alienated neighborhood in Tel Aviv, and people are... Um, that's the, the biggest version, I think, of New York life uh, that you can see in Israel. Like people don't usually say hi, and care just about each other, uh, each one about himself. And then when I went down to Eilat, I didn't have enough time to, I wanted to bring a um, sevuot. How do you say a sevuot in English? The ones that do bubbles. I wanted to bring bubbles because when you work with anxiety and you do bubbles, especially for little kids, it's very relaxing. And I didn't have time to buy it because the shop closes and I was in the hospital and I knew that I will get home too late and I have to leave for the airport. So I said, okay, and I WhatsApped in the neighborhood's uh, WhatsApp saying, I'm flying down to, to a light, I won't be in time. If there's anyone near the, the toy shop and can buy bubbles, then I will uh, send you the, the money. And when I came back home, I had boxes, <laughs> boxes of bubbles and toys, and they just bought the entire toy. I don't know who they were because nobody ever told me I bought this, pay me back. It was so many and I couldn't carry all of it with me because I could just take a, a trolley. And so I took another suitcase which was just completely full of bubbles. I'm thinking these are the same people that wouldn't say hi to each other in the street. And, and they did this. So maybe that's the one good thing that I can say about this time, is that it took out not just the worst of people, but also the, the best of people. Um, thank you so much. I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, okay. uh, I, I was just reading the book in Hebrew, Relocation. So I have two questions. The first, I'm interested in the names, in the, the, the both names, in Hebrew and the, the English. The other thing, I want to of you, another aspect of your uh, work as a psychotherapist, uh, uh, you know, I, I have a, a, a private psychotherapy practice uh, in Montreal, Canada. I'm just visiting here. So I'm so happy that I'm here. Uh, the whole uh, issue of uncertainty and the fear for the future, and you know, and often, you know, I mean, how much it is again manifested or dealt with uh, in the context of uh, psychotherapy. Uh, to that, I want to share. Um, I say something about the title. The title in English is the Wolf Hunt. The title in Hebrew is Relocation. And when my mother saw the Hebrew title, Relocation, the English word Relocation, written in Hebrew letters. And when my mother saw this, she was so upset. And she said, is this why Eliezer Ben Yehuda reinvented Hebrew? <laughs> so that you will write a Hebrew novel with the title Relocation? And, and I told her, and I stand behind it, I told her, Ima, Relocation is a word in Hebrew. It's not an English word. It's a Hebrew word. And I think now I can prove it because when the novel was about to be published in, in English, my American editor wrote to me and asked me if she could change the title because relocation, of course, it's an English word, but it carries no associations. It's not, it doesn't have, it's not layered. It's just a word, relocation. It doesn't echo, it doesn't smell like the American dream. It doesn't smell like doing it big in America. Okay, it doesn't smell like um, 
the gap of generation in the Israeli society between Yordim. Yordim is the term used to be called for Israelis who chose to immigrate from Israel. Yordim means in Hebrew, going down. So that if you leave Israel, you're going down. If you immigrate to Israel, you're going up. Now my knowledge in geography is that you're not really going down when you're leaving Israel, and you're not really going up when you're getting to Israel. But this is how we were taught, Aliyah Yerida. This is my parents' generation. In my generation, they're not called Yordim anymore. They're not going down. We're using not the Hebrew word Yordim, but the English word Lasot Relocation. And when one mother tells another mother, eventually you said relocation. You see a My son is there relocating to UCLA. Nobody's saying today, ah, Yordim, he's going down. People are actually saying, ah, wow, okay, my son is stuck here. <laughs> and this gap of generation, which is history's irony, which is something that I think my grandparents would, would be shocked. This is something that I want to tackle and is encapsulated in the Hebrew word relocation, but not in the American word. And the thing was, and I think my discussion with the, with the American editor was also for me um, a moment of cultural differences because I thought how, first of all, her email. She didn't say, we want to change the title, which is what they would say in Hebrew. She wrote, we love the title so much and we were wondering, <laughs> would you like to consider the possibility of other titles? Now, this took me years. To understand that when America tells you that they love the title, and if you would like to consider otherwise, what she's actually saying is we have to change the title. <laughs> and I thought I speak English, but I don't speak American, and it's different. Yes. Yeah, it took me a while. And I think this is something that I also wanted Lilach, the, the protagonist, to experience this feeling of being an outsider, that even if you understand the language, you don't get the music that everyone is dancing to. You're deaf to, to that music. And I think it has a lot to do with linguistics. Like, you know, in Hebrew, we don't have an equivalent to small talk. There is no translation of small talk to Hebrew. It's not a term in Hebrew. We don't have an equivalent to tact. Being tactful. <laughs> we never trust, we don't need this word, right? Not in the dictionary. Then again, in English, I don't think you have the right equivalent for uh, being dukri. Dukri? But is upfront a positive thing? Straightforward. Because I think. To say it in your face or to be upfront or to be straightforward is associated with being rude. Well, being dukri is associated with being honest. Get to the point. Get to the point already. But I think dukri is not just get to the point. Dukri is also like a dukri person. So, and we don't. Can't. And in Hebrew, being dugri, it's a very valuable <coughs> word. I think almost as much as being tactful is a valuable word. <laughs> and I also think about the English, the Yiddish word, chutzpah, which landed very well in English, but was never translated, right? It's chutzpah. So it has its own place right now, I think, in, in, in American culture, but as a Yiddish word, not as, it never fully got its green card. <laughs> and, and I found it to be very, very interesting. I think it was all encapsulated in this debate we had over the title, which I didn't even realize was a debate. <laughs> in the traditional Israeli content, uh, construct, there was a difference, a real hafada, between the Israeli and the Jew. The Jew was the diaspora Jew, and the Israeli was the new Jew, the brave Jew, and so on. Have you noticed any uh, break, chinks in that barrier, uh, where Israelis are perhaps, for the first time, seeing themselves as Jews in some ways, vulnerability ways, just like the Jews of the diaspora, or not really? 
That's a very good question. Um, the person will say that the diaspora Jew was always inside the Israeli Jew, just like when you look at a, at a grown man that grows up to be beating, you always see the beaten child that he used to be before he grew up to be a beating father himself. So I think we always had a very strong relationship with the diaspora Jew inside the Zionist movement. As much as people wanted to distance themselves from it, I think that's the stronger the link was. What we rebel against is what we're most linking to, otherwise we wouldn't be there rebelling. Um, I think it's interesting because I was asked to write the introduction to a Bialik's a poem, Be'ira Amida, in the city of slaughter. So I was asked to write the introduction to the German translation of Bialik. And they asked it a year ago. The, the deadline was December, being Israeli, and no plans to start doing it before November. <laughs> and when it's then October came, and the first thing Netanyahu, when he finally talked, gave his first speech to the nation, nine o'clock in, in Yom Shabbat, so many hours after, that's when he gave the first public speech, he quoted Bialik. He quoted not the city of slaughter, he quoted al And in this moment when Netanyahu chooses to quote Bialik, the national poet, the poet that talks about the pogrom in Kishinev, in his first speech to the nation, I, and, and Netanyahu is, you can say what you want about him, but he's a clever guy. He knows why he's quoting this. And this was, I feel, because everyone felt, and maybe there was the need for, for everyone to keep feeling as diaspora Jews in, in a pogrom uh, and under attack. I can say that in the novel, when the Israeli mother finds out that her child was bullied at school, she asks herself, was he bullied because he's Jewish and because the, the other kids um, didn't like him because he's Jewish? Or was he simply bullied because he's you know, one of those kids that get bullied? And it matters to her, this question. And I think she doesn't know what's worse, to think that your child was beaten because there's something within him that provokes it, or to think that he was beaten because of an identity that he never chose, that you gave to him. And I think both are... And I th for me, it was interesting to see how much of it is inside of us. We have um, uh, German friends um, that we met while we were trekking, and we became good friends. They came to us to Israel, we came to them to Germany. And we traveled together after the kids were born. And then, and her grandfather used to be um, quite, quite high in the, the Nazi regime. And my partner's grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. And the families became friends. And then there was this one day when her daughter, and they were three years old, was beating our daughter. And it was so interesting because me and my partner we acted, we were in, I would never react the same way to the same event in Tel Aviv. It just triggered in a second, and you know, the things that it was unbelievable how much we talked about. I think the entire vacation, every evening when the day was over, we sat there and we said, that little Aryan, yeah. what is it? <laughs> <laughs> and, I was shocked by, by, at first I thought that we were laughing, but we weren't laughing. We were discussing about it a lot. And this was a moment when you realize that we can be friends, we can hike together, track together, choose to be together, but at the same time, there is something tattooed on our heart. And it takes an instance to, to get it out there. Thank you. Um, actually, I want to... Um, to commend you for the, this title and that relocation. I read the Hebrew version relocation. And my first question when I became aware of this book, I said, hmm, same thing, you know, why it's an English, supposedly an English word, why not use this title? But this really made me start thinking about this essence of the story. 
And I haven't read the English version, but I do know about Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf. And I, for me, the association was there is a wolf in the forest or in society or somewhere um, that, that endangers that we don't know what the purpose or what's the, the uh, intentions of this wolf. And it is described very well in the book, The Location, and here too, I'm sure, you know. And I thought that this was a brilliant title to really start us thinking about, and I don't know if that's the reason why you call it this, but it's like saying, there is a wolf in the forest, and little Red Riding Hood trusted this wolf, and then she was proven wrong. There was, did she have reasons to distrust this wolf? I mean, he used all his magic, you know, about it, and, and yet, she was hurt by him, and the grandmother was dead. And she, you know, there was a savior at the end. But um, I thought that this was a really clever, so you can take the credit for the title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for saying it. I would say that I. What's that? I was really intrigued by the, the question of where is that wolf and how we're always looking for the wolf out there and could it be that we're missing the, the, the wolf inside and I thought, you know, when I started writing it and I thought about the mother like a police detective and, and that the riddle she's trying to solve, the mystery that she's trying to solve is her own kid. And I think every mother has a bit of a police detective in her, like every mother of a teenager looks at her kid as if it was this mystery, this riddle that she's trying to solve. And I thought about the first um, police detective that I know, the first detective story that I know, which I think is King Oedipus. You remember the story of King Oedipus and there is the plague on Tebai, and he is told that if he wants the plague to stop, he has to find out who killed the former king. And then he launches an investigation like a detective, to find out who killed the former king. And he's certain that the murderer, that the aggressor, is out there roaming in the dark streets of Tobai. And what Oedipus doesn't acknowledge, and, and, it's, and that's the hubris, right? That's the sin of pride. That he thinks he knows himself, and he thinks he needs his intellectual ability to know the enemy, to, to identify the other. And that's a sin of pride because he doesn't realize his own aggressiveness. And the moment he does, that's a spoiler a lot, by the end of the novel, the novel of the play, when Oedipus does realize and sees himself for who he really is, that's when he takes his eyes out. And if you think about every detective holding the magnified glass, the, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. the idea that a detective wants to see everything. But do we really want to see everything? Because when Oedipus really sees himself, that's when he chooses to blind himself. And I ask myself this mother that wants to know the truth, and she's like a police detective, and she wants to see her son as he truly is. Does she? Or could it be that when she will be faced with, with the choice, she would rather choose blindness instead? Hi. Uh Thank you. Um, so my question is, goes off, you'd said earlier that it was hard for you to read, especially your own work, after October 7th, and I'm wondering about your thoughts on the role of fiction going forward, and especially in your fiction. Um, I'm thinking a lot about, it's a, not, not the same, but if I have to make a comparison, in the lockdown era of the pandemic, I think we were all, a lot of us were in a state of paralysis and didn't want to write about what was going on. And now that that period has uh, more or less passed right now, people don't even want to read about it because they want to pretend like it never happened. Um, they're acting like it never happened. And you know, you gave anecdotes about how you create a beginning, middle, and the end so people can um, end their stories and leave it in the past. But for fiction, how do you see this going forward in the writing about the Israel experience, or, or how should it go forward? Can you 
we'll take two more questions okay. and then we'll answer them. Um, you mentioned uh, revenge uh, in the Israeli society, and there have been uh, some um, articles and things I've heard maybe twice for people that were directly affected and lost and were part of the massacre, and, and they were, um, they're talking about forgiveness and, um, and um, moving forward and learning from Holocaust for the generation that forgave the Germans. Um, I was curious that if you think that, that these people, that many of them were uh, peace activists as well, it seems like, um, would, um, would um, be the seed of the um, future of any sort of healing that would go on with the other side. Thank you. I haven't had the pleasure yet <clears throat> of reading your book, but I was wondering, very often a book will attract a certain demographic or age group, generation, or people with particular orientation are drawn to a book. And I was wondering if there is a particular readership that has been drawn to this book that you can identify. Um, it was very interesting with, with this book because it was very, a lot of them different reactions from different audiences. Um, parents told, started telling me about their own experiences, teenagers hiding themselves from their parents. Uh, I had readers coming and saying, yeah, I was bullied and I never told my mom. And I don't know if my child today is the bully or being bullied. Um, I had a mother and a daughter coming together to one of the events and the mother said, I don't want my child to ever be a bully because I was bullied when I was a girl and I don't want to think that my daughter is capable of doing something like this to somebody else. <laughs> and her daughter was sitting next to her and her daughter said, so mom, are you actually saying that you prefer me to be bullied because you had a, a bad experience? And, and not to, so it, sometimes readers like the, the meeting with readers was very charged. Um, so a lot of parents in the readership and, and also teenagers. Um, and I think it was read very differently in different countries. So that when the book was out in um, Holland, for instance, in the Netherlands, people read it mostly as a, like a metaphor for uh, Israel. They talked a lot about Israel and about Jewish identity, Israeli identity, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When it came out in Brazil, I wasn't even asked about it, I think, in, in the entire reading tour, because they just read it as a, as a story about a mother and a child, and the universal question of all mothers, how much do I really know my own child? And the political dimension wasn't important for them at all. And so I think maybe it, it varies between cultures. And I, I will go back to your question about writing after October 7th. And I wish I had an answer. I feel like I'm too close right now to, like when you stand too close to, to a picture to, to be able to actually look at it and you have to take a few, a few steps back. And I don't know how it's going to, to look from now on. We have this dark joke that's running that, you know how right before October 7th it was supposed to be 50 years to the 73 war? And there was a lot of documentaries and I'm, and I named the Yelet after my uncle was killed in the 73 war. His name was Yelet. So we had to watch all the documentaries and we, we had to go to all the ceremonies. And then me and somebody else from my family when October 7th happened said, Okay, well, at least that's enough for documentaries about the 73 war, because they're going to make a whole different documentaries from now on. And I think, on the one hand, there's this feeling like everything is going to be just about this. That's why I can't write anything, because that's the only thing I can imagine. But then I'm thinking how I always hated as an Israeli author, 
abroad to recognize that some people only think about me as this representation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that for some people I can't write a love story, I can't write a boy meets girl, I can't write about a, a mother-child relationship, I'm doomed to write about either the occupation or the Holocaust, and that's my entire identity. And I really hope that people will be able to read and to write uh, stupid love songs uh, after October 7th. I think we will need this just as much as we will need to dare and look at what happened to us and what we did to ourselves. Yeah. And the, the last question yeah, you asked. The son of Vivian Silva wrote a very powerful uh, piece about forgiveness. And I think if these will be the, the voices that we will hear and the voices that will echo, then, then Israel doesn't have to be compared to a beating father that, that you have to take your kids out to, to protect them. But there are also other voices right now. And I'm scared and worried about these other voices. And I remember where we were before the, the war started. I remember how much hope I felt during the the demonstration. For the first time, I think, in years, we had this energy, this feeling that we can actually create something different. And, and I just hope that we were able to, to rise up from the ashes and, and create something different, because, you know, I have a two-year-old boy in the house, and if we don't, then in 16 years he's supposed to get recruited to the army, and, and I think that we, my generation owes it to his generation, but things have to be different. Like, yeah, and sadly that was exactly what mom says and said in 1973, hoping that, uh, but we shall hope for a different reality and maybe um, from this awakening of the civil society, we'll see some good outcomes in Israel. I want to thank you all for joining us to this evening.